you so far. Um, seeing Mexico City and Guanajuato, is that right? It'll be good. Um, so yeah, so I, I've been at the UNC at UNC Chapel Hill for about 20 years. Um, I came when the rest of the staff came, started coming, uh, at least towards the end of, of the 1990s. And I can give a specific date. I'm going to lean away from my age there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I've been doing work. Um, with various Hispanic immigrant communities throughout North Carolina for 20 years and before that um, I was in California where I also did a lot of um, volunteer basis, a lot of work with Latino communities and um, took many trips to Guatemala and Mexico and uh, elsewhere. Um, so I, in this presentation I'm going to be kind of leisurely because I have a bunch of slides, but um, the slides kind of speak for themselves, so I don't have a whole lot of words to add to the slides. Um, but I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Rebecca Tippett, who is the director of Carolina Demography at the Carolina Population Center at UNC Chapel Hill, and she's helped prepare some of the slides that we have today. We've been partnering on this for, for a while, just keeping updated. <laughs> And on the, the <laughs> um, so I'm going to take about 30 minutes to catch you up on the Hispanic or Latinx population in North Carolina. But since we have an hour, we should have um, plenty of time for, for questions at the end of the presentation. And I can go backwards and, and forwards and um, talk more about, this is going to be a lot of statistics here. Um, but I can also talk about some of my qualitative work um, if we can get into that in the discussion. Um, so I want to first start by sharing a few words about terminology. Right? So, so these days there's a bit of indecision um, on, on the best terminology to use. The term Hispanic was introduced by the U.S. Census in 1980. So to me, that seems relatively recent. I don't know. To some of the students, that seems like old history. Um, but so very recently, in 1980, the term Hispanic was used. And it's preferred by some Hispanic or Latinx populations. If you're speaking Spanish, you'll often hear the word Hispano. And how many of you, just out of curiosity, speak Spanish? All right. Wow, that's awesome. OK. Um, so the term Latino or Latina is preferred by others uh, in the U.S. with the O, for those of you who know, referring to males and the A referring to, to females. And, but most recently, uh, younger Latinas and Latinos have introduced the more gender neutral term, uh, Latinx. So, so for some, that it can roll off the tongue. For others, it's, it's new and it's hard to get used to. Um, I'll be primarily using the term Hispanic, which is typically used in federal and state level data. But I think it's important to remember with all these terms that these are not used in Latin America. Okay, this is, these are very US-centric concepts. They're not used in Europe either. These are, these are, these are US centric ideas, Latino, it's that, all that, and that's, it's all US. So the big news um, is that the Hispanic population is nearing one million. So we've gone from a little over 750,000, um, and I think you have slides that you'll be getting a copy of these slides, so you don't feel like you have to write everything down. So we got from a little over 750,000 in 1990, when I arrived, sort of, in, in North Carolina, to, to 800,000 in, in 2010. And since 2010, the growth of the Hispanic population um, in the state has now slowed. So nevertheless, we're at 972,288. 
license to be precise. Of course, we'll get new data soon, and we'll see what, what happens with our numbers there. So that the growth in, in the Hispanic population has slowed. Um, North Carolina's Hispanic population has continued to grow um, faster than the national average. So the population grew, to be precise, 20.5% between 2010 and 2017. And so we're in that the sort of second lightest shade there. And nationally, the Hispanic, Hispanic population increased 16.1%. Uh, About one in four, yes, one in four Hispanic residents live in just two counties. So Mecklenburg, and where we are today, Wake County. And the others are really spread along the I-90 and along the I-80. You can sort of draw those through the map where you got your borders there in the state. That's not surprisingly, right? That's where commerce is located along the highway. That's where new populations tend to settle. So if you live in, in rural North Carolina, you might feel like the growth in the Hispanic population is higher than the rest of the state. And you'd be right, absolutely. So 9% of North Carolina, Carolina's population is currently Hispanic. But Hispanics make up a greater share of the populations in, in these rural counties. Mm -hmm. So for example, out there to the right, there's a little red dot on eastern North Carolina. And that's too far. Duplin County is about 22%. You have to, yeah. go ahead, you sure? No, you're fine. <laughs> okay, the majority of all Hispanics in North Carolina are U.S. born. I, go, I want to underscore that point. They are U.S. born citizens. Since 2010, the foreign-born Hispanic population has not been growing. Okay? Instead, the Hispanic population growth is being really perpetuated by births to North Carolinians in the state and by decisions of Hispanic residents like me from other states moving to North Carolina. And why not? Right? We have beautiful mountains, beautiful beaches, terrific educational and employment opportunities. So this is a great place to, to live, a great place to move to, and non-Hispanic populations have been moving to North Carolina too. The Hispanic population represents a real diversity of cultural and ethnic backgrounds as well. So 57% of Hispanics in the state identify Mexican as their primary Hispanic background. But 11% identify as Puerto Rican heritage. That would be me. Any other Puerto Ricans in there? All right, so and another 15% are of Central American background. So Salvador, Honduran, Guatemala. That's been growing So this diversity is, of course, reflected in the country of origin, right? Of the foreign-born population, foreign-born. So we see 236,951 foreign-born Mexicans in the state. But really, not all that big when you think about it. Um, so one thing, um, my students always like to know is why did foreign born Hispanics start to live here? And you had Hannah Gill talking to you earlier, so I'm sure she had a much longer explanation of why Hispanics start to move here. But I'll give you a very short answer. And the short answer is that we invited them to move here. 
right? The state has built trading partnerships with Mexico over several decades. And Mexico is one of our top five trading partners. Top, top two, right here. Right, so just last year we had 3.6 billion, or it's not last year anymore, <laughs> it's a little, little beyond last year, but we had 3.6 billion in exports, billion with a B, with Mexico. So Hispanics have had a major positive economic impact in the state of North Carolina. And given that the Hispanic population has come to North Carolina to work, it's really no surprise that 71% of all Hispanics are in the labor market. And they're working. Hispanics typically have a higher labor force participation rate than any other racial ethnic group in North Carolina. Yeah? I'm not sure. You know this off the top of your head. Is that both the wage and the uh, um, legal uh, labor force participation rate? So the labor force participation rate would include everybody who's working and working for pay. If you're a homemaker and you're working, but you're not getting paid, you're not included in the labor force. Um, only 5.6% of those who are looking for work do not have a job. So that's the unemployment rate as of 2017. The Hispanic population is also highly entrepreneurial, establishing many new businesses in the state. And in 2016, which is the most recent data we have, According to the survey of business owners, Hispanic-owned firms had five billion in sales. This slide's a little tricky because I had to get everything to fit on the same slide, so you have to multiply the number here and the number down there, and, and we get the value. Um, but we had five billion in sales uh, in 2017. The payroll for Hispanic-owned firms had surpassed one billion. So we're at 1.4 billion. All right. So a lot of activity here, a lot of economic power. But to sustain the increase in economic impact of Hispanics, as well as other population groups in the state, it's really important to invest in education. Right? So what you guys are doing is incredibly important. To me, educators are the crux of our economy. My mother was an educator. She was a teacher for many years and retired about 10 years ago. So you guys are awesome and awesomely important. Um, so North Carolina's Hispanic population is quite young. As a result, nearly one in three North Carolinians under age 18 are Hispanic. So the Hispanic in the, in the red column. So one in three under age 18 are Hispanic. And you get that by adding up 14 plus 16, because everybody here is under 18. As of 2017, there were 370,000 children in North Carolina who identified as Hispanic or Latino, or Latinx. So you will remember that I said most, or 59% of Hispanics in North Carolina are U.S. born citizens. Well, that percentage is even higher, of course, if we focus on children, right? So nearly 93% 93% of Hispanic children are U.S. born citizens. And slightly over 1% are naturalized citizens. So that brings us to 94%. So that means that only about 5 to 6% of Hispanic children are not U.S. citizens. Small. It's not what you hear in the media. Hispanic youth 
graduate high school at relatively high rates, 80%. But we could do better. That's not high enough. We have some work to do. Our graduation rates for Hispanics lag behind every other racial ethnic group in the state. And Hispanic children are eager to go to college, and many do. But here, too, we have some work to do. The college enrollment of both Blacks and Hispanics lags behind Asians and whites. And we can make improvements in the educational attainment of youth by increasing the affordability of college, making sure that every North Carolina high school graduate has access to in-state tuition. We don't do that now, but we could. We can help by helping youth apply for federal, state, and private educational loans. And we can help by helping students whose parents may never have attended college with the application process. So this assistance, especially with the application process and navigating college, navigating the process of getting into college, that assistance is needed because 76%, again, from the far right, 76% of Hispanic youth have parents who have not completed college. Their children would be first-generation college students. So we also have some work to do on helping both Black and Hispanic youth complete college. Many start, but do not complete college because of affordability. They are balancing complex work and complex family demands as they aim to complete their educational goals. Thus, our college programs need to be structured with that in mind. And without these investments in education, we'll continue to see large disparities in educational attainment by race, ethnicity in North Carolina. So this slide shows some of those disparities. Only 22% that bottom left, 22% of Hispanics in North Carolina have completed at least a two-year college degree, the associate's degree. Um, I'm sorry. Is there any sort of data that's being collected from students who are choosing to do something that's more on the career or technical side of things? Because a lot of my students have no desire to go on to the college level because they can apprentice with someone or do some sort of internship where they're going to be welding or plumbing or doing something to that effect and they're going to be making more money than I am <laughs> soon after work seven kind of days. So is there, I mean, some of them are choosing not to go because they don't see the value in going into debt to get an education to get a job that you might not necessarily pay off that debt for. So I'm just curious, is there any sort of there's a lot packed into that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a career technical educator, it's kind of like, yeah. well, you know, it's not necessarily that these students may not have, a, I, I know in our county we're really pushing for these students to go, but they're also like, dude, I can make more money if I go directly into the workforce instead of doing that. So yes, I do want everyone to go to college and get education, but also some of them are like just a very money focused and so it's not, okay, never mind. Yeah, I, I want to I come back to that. I want to come back to that because I think that's very, very important. Um, so the simple answer to your question is that yes, there are data available. Um, but of course, that's the population that we were looking at before that's graduated high school. So you look at your high school graduation rate, rate and they have not gone on to get um, an associate degree. Um, so then I think we can have a broader conversation about the value of getting your college degree and the value of having um, vocational type programs and pathways and apprenticeship type programs and pathways to other opportunities because they are incredibly important and you're absolutely right. Not everybody 
gets the sort of same economic lift from getting a college education and supporting them. So, um, but going back to the college education and looking, this looks at all of North Carolina uh, youth broken up by race and ethnicity, but now breaking them up by foreign born or US born. So here we see that we actually, we need to do a better job for all of our youth. Because in most cases, foreign born residents of North Carolina have higher educational attainment than US born residents. The, the exception being the the red dot is U.S. born, the exception being Hispanic population who are foreign born tend to come in with, with lower educational levels. But compared to the rest of the world, we are lagging behind. So in addition to these investments in education, well-being of North Carolina's children and adults also depends on investments in their health. So that's some of what, what I'm involved in as well. And in North Carolina, Hispanic adults are the least likely to have health insurance. They're the least likely to have a personal doctor or have a checkup in the past 12 months. Overall, Hispanic adults report the highest rates of fair to poor health, as well as high rates of both overweight and physical activity. But overweight, of course, is an issue that we've seen in many of, in, in all race ethnic populations. In the US. Where is that data coming from? This data is from the CDC. They do a, what's called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. So every year they ask a cross section of the country um, questions about, about their health. And so we get a new cross section every year, and that's one of the ways we, we monitor health in, in the US. And much of the other data has come from uh, the U.S. Census and uh, the American Community Survey, which is done every year. Um, and the U.S. Census, of course, is, is done every 10 years. And in the, in the slides that you will get, I, have, I usually have the source noted, but in very tiny font. Um, Do they, like, cross-reference this information to, like, uh, like food deserts and stuff like that? Like, do they assess? Oh, like, boy, you guys, like, really want to get into research. <laughs> 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 yes, I mean, those, those kind of things are, are possible. I and mean, there's better data sets for that, the, for that particular question, than the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. Because the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey is really good at giving us state-level estimates, but not too great at giving estimates in a, in a Sort of more local level, which you would need to get at to look at food deserts. I think I just want to ask questions. I'm excited. That's great. No shame. No shame. You have to ask questions. That's what's fun. So, all right. Um, <laughs> no, you guys are awesome. So, okay. So, where was I? So, um, yeah, so then Hispanic children. So just a couple more slides here. So Hispanic <coughs> children, too, are at risk of poor access to health care and poor health. They have the highest rates of uninsurance. They and many of their peers from other racial ethnic groups are reporting high rates of sadness and hopelessness. And this comes from the youth behavior factors in the Yes, there's a youth version and an adult version. Um, and for Hispanic youth, uh, some of the sadness and hopelessness may be st stemming from the environment in which they live. Right? We see this with increasing reports of feeling unsafe at school or going to school. I was shocked when I 
pulled down these data at the end of last year. As of 2017, 15% of Hispanics, 12% of Blacks, and 11% of Asians reported feeling unsafe at school or going to school, and that's in comparison to 7% of Whites. But really, no child should ever feel unsafe going to school. In closing, the data show that Hispanics in North Carolina are primarily U.S. born citizens who are making substantial economic and cultural contributions to the state and by investing in their education and investing in their health, we really invest in North Carolina's future. And so uh, thank you so much for listening and that's where I will leave it and take questions. At